Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making the start, at least, on my review of The Virgin Suicides by Jeffrey Eugenides. So, as you can see, I picked this up for a pound from a charity shop. Heard a lot about it. I have seen the movie years ago, but I don't really remember it. Um, so I just thought I'd chance it, you know. So I'm going to read you the blurb, then we're going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. The haunting, humorous and tender story of the brief lives of the five entrancing Lisbon sisters, The Virgin Suicides, now a major film, is Jeffrey Eugenides' classic debut novel. The shocking thing about the girls was how nearly normal they seemed when their mother let them out for the one and only date of their lives. Twenty years on, their enigmatic personalities are embalmed in the memories of the boys who worship them and who now recall their shared adolescence. The brazier draped over a crucifix belonging to the promiscuous Lux, the sisters' breathtaking appearance on the night of the dance, and the sultry, sleepy street across which they watched a family disintegrate and fragile lives disappear. So I thought this was a cracking opening here. So this is just um, the opening paragraph to chapter one. Trigger warnings for suicide, of course. On the morning the last Lisbon daughter took her turn at suicide, it was Mary this time, and sleeping pills, like Therese. The two paramedics arrived at the house knowing exactly where the knife drawer was. The two paramedics arrived at the house knowing exactly where the knife drawer was, and the gas oven, and the beam in the basement from which it was possible to tie a rope. They got out of the EMS truck, as usual moving much too slowly in our opinion, and the fat one said under his breath, This ain't TV folks, this is how fast we go. He was carrying the heavy respirator and cardiac unit past the bushes that had grown monstrous and over the erupting lawn, tame and immaculate 13 months earlier when the trouble began. Uh, I thought this was some great characterisation and stuff here as well. Um, we assumed Mr and Mrs Lisbon were in agreement about the new leniency, but when we met with Mr Lisbon years later, he told us his wife had never agreed with a psychiatrist. She just gave in for a while, he said. Divorced by that time, he lived alone in an efficiency apartment, the floor of which was covered with shavings from his wood carvings. Wilted birds and frogs crowded the shelves. According to Mr Lisbon, he had long harboured doubts about his wife's strictness, knowing in his heart that girls forbidden to dance would only attract husbands with bad complexions and sunken chests. Also, the odour of all those cooped up girls had begun to annoy him. He felt at times as though he were living in the birdhouse at the zoo. Everywhere he looked he found hairpins and fuzzy combs, and because so many females roamed the house they forgot he was a male and, and discussed their menstruation openly in front of him. Cecilia had just gotten her period on the same day of the month as the other girls, who were all synchronised in their lunar rhythms. Those five days of each month were the worst for Mr Lisbon, who had to dispense aspirin as though feeding the ducks and comfort crying jags that arose because a dog was killed on TV. He said the girls also displayed a dramatic womanliness during their monthly time. They were more languorous, descended the stairs in an actressy way, and kept saying with a wink, Cousin Herbie's come for a visit. On some nights they sent him out to buy more Tampax, not just one box, but four or five, and the young store clerks with their thin moustaches would smirk. He loved his daughters, they were precious to him, but he longed for the presence of a few boys. After Cecilia's uh, suicide attempt, it says that none of the other girls had any braces, none of the other girls had any bracelets on, and we assumed they'd given Cecilia all they had. Uh, again, I, I just think a lot of this is really, like, really well written. And um, so this is another paragraph I want to read out. It's well written, but it also is important to the story and adds to the story as well, you know. There had never been a funeral in our town before, at least not during our lifetimes. The majority of dying had happened during the Second World War when we didn't exist and our fathers were impossibly skinny young men in black and white photographs. Dads on jungle airstrips, dads with pimples and tattoos, dads with pinups, dads who wrote love letters to the girls who would become our mothers, dads inspired by K-rations, loneliness and glandular riot in malarial air into poetic referees that ceased entirely once they got back home. Now our dads were middle-aged with paunches and shins rubbed hairless from years of wearing pants, but they were still a long way from death. Their own parents, who spoke foreign languages and lived in converted attics like buzzards, had the finest medical care available and were threatening to live on until the next century. Nobody's grandfather had died, nobody's grandmother, nobody's parents, only a few dogs. Tom Burke's beagle, Muffin, who choked on Bazooka Joe bubblegum. And then, the, and then that summer, a creature who in dog years was still a puppy, Cecilia Lisbon. And um, uh, this is interesting because of the... Uh, Obviously, uh, religion and suicide don't tend to go well together. I mean, suicide doesn't really go well with anything, does it? But you know what I mean. Um, so it says, officially, Cecilia's death was listed in church records as an accident, as were the other girls a year later. When we asked Father Moody about this, he said, We didn't want to quibble. How do you know she didn't slip? When we brought up the sleeping pills and the noose and the rest of it, he said, Suicide, as a mortal sin, is a matter of intent. 
It's, it's very difficult to know what was in those girls' hearts, what they were really trying to do. And now uh, there's this kind of recurring thing throughout this that uh, the grave diggers are on strike, but it says here, um, the hearse had trouble getting through the gate because of the picketing, but when the strikers learned the deceased age, they parted and even lowered their angry placards. And then we get this bit here. Uh, Look at her nails, Mr. Burton, thought he heard her say. Couldn't they do something about her nails? And then Mr. Lisbon replied, they'll grow out. Fingernails keep growing. She can't bite them now, dear. Well, actually, that's false because that's not what happens. What actually happens is the skin keeps receding. And so it looks as though the fingernails are growing, but it's actually just the skin shrinking back. Now you know, the more you know. We have a thing here. Uh, Paul Baldino asked us the riddle. What smells like fish is fun to eat, but isn't fish. No comment. There's a great line here. Mr. Lisbon had the feeling that he didn't know who she was, that children were only strangers you agreed to live with. And then I thought this was interesting and a nice bit of characterization. Uh, Mr. Lisbon went on his usual nighttime rounds, checking to see that the front door was locked. It wasn't. That the garage light was off. It was. And that none of the burners on the stove had been left on. None had. He turned off the light in the first floor bathroom, where he found Kyle Krieger's retainer in the sink, left from when he'd taken it out left from when he'd taken it out during the party to eat cake. Mr. Lisbon ran the retainer under water, examining the pink shell form fitted to the roof of Kyle's mouth, the crenellations in the plastic that encircled the turret of his teeth, the looping front wire bent at key spots, you could see plier marks, to provide modulated pressure. Mr. Lisbon knew his parental and neighbourly duty entailed putting the retainer in a Ziploc bag, calling the Kriegers and telling them their expensive orthodontal device was in safe keeping. Acts like these, simple, humane, conscientious, forgiving, held life together. Only a few days earlier he would have been able to perform them. But now he took the retainer and dropped it in the toilet. He pressed the handle. The retainer, jo the retainer jostled in the surge, disappeared down the porcelain throat and, when waters abated, floated triumphantly, mockingly, out. Mr. Lisbon waited for the tank to refill and flushed again, but the same thing happened. The replica of the boy's mouth clung to the white slope. Some statistics here which I presume were at least accurate at the time of writing. We learn that there were 80 suicides per day in America, 30,000 per year, that an attempt or completion happened every minute, a completion every 18 minutes, that three to four times as many males completed suicide, but three times as many females attempted it, that more whites than non-whites completed suicide, that the rate of suicide among the young, 15 to 24, had tripled in the last four decades, that suicide was the second leading cause of death among high school students, that 25% of all suicides occurred in the 15 to 24 age group, but that, contrary to our expectations, the highest rate of suicide was found among white males over 50. So um, I'm going to read this paragraph out just because I think it's quite, quite the paragraph. Though she carried on few extended conversations, we got an idea of her state of mind from the little that got back to us of the little she said. She told Bob McBreerly that she couldn't live without getting it regular, though she delivered the phrase with a Brooklyn accent as though imitating a movie. A sense of play acting permeated much of her behaviour. Willie Tate admitted that, despite her eagerness, she didn't seem to like it much, and many boys described similar inattention. Lifting their heads from the soft shelf of Lux's neck, they found her eyes open, her brow knitted in thought, or at the height of passion they felt her pick a pimple on their backs. Nevertheless, on the roof, Lux reportedly said pleading things like, put it in, just for a minute, it will make us feel close. Other times she treated the app like some small chore, positioning the boys, undoing zippers and buckles with the weariness of a checkout girl. She oscillated wildly in her contraceptive vigilance. Some reported her administering complex procedures, inserting three or four jellies or creams at once, topping them off with a white spermicide she referred to as the cream cheese. Occasionally sufficed with her Australian method, which involved shaking up a Coke bottle and hosing down her insides. In stricter moods, she laid down her catchphrase ultimatum, no erection without protection. Often she used sanitised pharmaceutical products. Other times, presumably cut, off by, presumably cut off by Mrs Lisbon's blockade, she fell back on the ingenious methods devised by midwives in centuries past. Vinegar proved useful, as did tomato juice. Love's tiny sea craft foundered in acidic seas. Lux kept an assortment of bottles as well as one foul rag behind the chimney. Nine months later, when the reefers hired by the new young couple found the bottles, they called down to the young wife. Looks like somebody was having salad up here. I don't recommend any of those methods of contraception, by the way. We have a, an N bomb in here. The phrase uh, N asterisk, 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 pile with a hyphen. This was first published in 1993, so you probably shouldn't be calling it that. I'd never heard that as well. It must be an American thing because 
I don't know, maybe we use it in the UK. I thought this was um, interesting. Mrs. Lisbon's mother, Lima Crawford, mentioned during that same crackling phone call to New Mexico that she had given Mrs. Lisbon most of her summer pickles and preserves. And she had hesitated saying summer because that had been the summer Cecilia had died. And all the while the cucumbers, strawberries, and even she herself, 71 years old, had gone on growing and living. We get uh, this odd little paragraph. It's the smell of trapped beaver, Paul Baldino said sagely, and we didn't know enough to disagree, but we found it hard to imagine such an aroma issuing from the ventricles of love. The smell was partly bad breath, cheese, milk, tongue film, but also the singed smell of drilled teeth. It was the kind of bad breath you get used to the closer you go in, until you can't really notice because it's your own breath too. Over the years, of course, the open mouths of women have blown into our faces ingredients of that original smell and occasionally, poised over unfamiliar bedsheets in the dark of that night's betrayal or blind date, we've greedily welcomed any new particular reek because of its partial connection to the fu because of its partial connection to the fumes that began blowing from the Lisbon house shortly after it was closed up and never really stopped. Right now, if we concentrate, we can smell it still. It found us in our airbed. It found us in our beds and on the playground as we played kill the man with the ball. It came down the stairs of the Carafelices, so the old Mrs. Carafelici dreamed that she was back in Bursa cooking grape leaves. It reached us even over the stink of Joe Barton's grandfather's cigar, as he showed us the photo album of his navy days, explaining that the plump women in petticoats were only his cousins. Strangely enough, even though the smell was overpowering, we didn't once think of holding our breaths, or, as a last resort, breathing through our mouths, and after the first few days we sucked in the aroma like mother's milk. Man, this guy can write a paragraph, I'm telling you. And uh, again, a, another uh, excerpt I want to read here. We'd like to tell you with the, we'd like to tell you with authority what it was like inside the Lisbon house, or what the girls felt being imprisoned in it. Sometimes, drained by this investigation, we long for some shred of evidence, some Rosetta Stone that would explain the girls at last. But even though that winter was certainly not a happy one, little more can be averred. Trying to locate the girls' exact pain is like the self-examination doctors urge us to make. We've reached that age. On a regular basis, we're forced to explore with clinical detachment our most private pouch and, pressing it, impress ourselves with its anatomical reality. Two turtle eggs bedded in a nest of tiny sea grapes, with tubes snaking in and out, knobbed with nodules of gristle. We're asked to find in this dimly mapped place, amid naturally occurring clots and coils, upstart invaders. We never realised how many bumps we had until we went looking. And so we lie on our backs, probing, recoiling, probing again, and the seeds of death get lost in the mess God made us. It's no different with the girls. Hardly have we begun to palpate their grief than we find ourselves wondering whether this particular wound was mortal or not, or whether, in our blind doctoring, it's a wound at all. It might just as well be a mouth, which is as wet and as warm. The scar might be over the heart or the kneecap, we can't tell. All we can do is go groping up the legs and arms, over the soft bivalvular torso, to the imagined face. It is speaking to us, but we can't hear. And again, another couple of paragraphs that I've highlighted here. It's interesting to me that there are bits where it's back-to-back -back paragraphs, often about totally different things, and I'm like, wow, that was an amazing paragraph. Wow, that was also an amazing paragraph. Like, you're talking, I'd normally find two or three of them in an average novel, I guess. So it's weird to have two of them back-to-back, -back, two times in a row. In the end, it wasn't death that surprised her, but the stubbornness of life. She couldn't understand how the Lisbons kept so quiet, why they didn't wail to heaven or go mad. Seeing Mr. Lim seeing Mr. Lisbon stringing Christmas lights, she shook her head and muttered. She let go of the special geriatric banister installed along the first floor, took a few steps at sea level without support, and for the first time in seven years suffered no pain. Demo explained it to us like this. We Greeks are a moody people. Suicide makes sense to us. Putting up Christmas lights after your own daughter does it, that makes no sense. What my yaya could never understand about America was why everyone pretended to be happy all the time. Winter is the season of alcoholism and despair. Count the drunks in Russia or the suicides at Cornell. So many exam takers threw themselves into the gorge of that hilly campus that the university declared a midwinter holiday to ease the tension, popularly known as Suicide Day. The holiday popped up in a computer search we ran, along with Suicide Ride and Suicide Mobile. We don't understand those Cornell kids any better, some Bianca with her first diagram and all life ahead of her plunging off the footbridge, cus cushioned only by her down vest, dark existential Bill with his closed cigarettes and Salvation Army overcoat, not leaping as Bianca did, but easing himself over the rail and hanging on for dear death before letting go. Shoulder muscles show tears in 33% of people choosing bridges. The other 67% just jump. We mention this now only to show that even college students, free to booze and fornicate, bring about their own ends in large numbers. 
Imagine what it was like for the Lisbon girls, shut up in their house with no blaring stereo or ready bong around. And then the girls try and protect a tree. Uh, girls, girls, the foreman said. You're too late, the tree's already dead. That's what you say, said Mary. It's got beetles. We have to take it down so they won't spread to other trees. There's no scientific evidence that removal limits infestations, said Therese. These trees are ancient. They have evolutionary strategies to deal with beetles. Why don't you just leave it up to nature? If we left it up to nature, there'd be no trees left. That's what it's going to be like anyway, said Lux. If boats didn't bring the fungus from Europe in the first place, Bonnie said, none of this would ever have happened. You can't put the genie back in the bottle, girls. Now we've got, now we've got to use our own technology to see what we can save. And then he says, actually, none of this might have been spoken. We piece it together through partial accounts and can attest only to the general substance. We also get this, which is very 2020. Um, we saw him attacking the overgrowth of each room, hacking away with his dustpan, and on the third day he began wearing a surgical mask because of the dust. So yeah, overall, as you can probably tell, I really enjoyed this actually. I thought it was really, really well written, a really gripping storyline as well. It kind of lived up to the hype at them some for me. I'm giving this a 5 out of 5, and this is... Uh, I would say in my top five books of this year so far, definitely, if not top three. It might even be top. I can't remember what else I've read this year, but it's definitely up there. And uh, I have a new favourites video coming soon, so I'll, I'll get another chance to talk about it then. So there you have it. That's what I thought of The Virgin Suicides by Jeffrey Eugenides. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.